I want to start my talk with a little bit of audience participation. I want you guys to sit back in your chair and remember the first Broadway show you ever saw. Um, I'll share mine. Uh, mine was a 1980 production of Peter Pan, but, but that might not be yours. I want you to think back to your first Broadway show, and I want you to yell out the emotions and the adjectives you think of when you think of that show. Okay, I heard you guys are the guys who wrote the posters that hang on the things. I heard, I heard wonderful, awesome, thrilling, etc. All of that maps onto my experience back with Peter Pan when I was four years old too. But the question I want to ask today is, why? I mean, think about it. I'm four years old. My parents paid a ton of money at the time in the 1980s to send me on stage to watch some adult woman who I didn't know in tights running around pretending to be this fictitious person in a pretend place that I had never seen. Right, like, why are we into this? I mean, on the, on the one hand, like, obviously, obviously we love theater, right? This is why Broadway is a multi-billion dollar industry. This is why you guys are all here. But as a psychologist, I have to say that the fact that we love theater <laughs> is pretty weird, right? Why do we pay our hard-earned money to sit there quietly and watch people on the stage do stuff in lands we've never heard of and singing these crazy songs and so on? Like, why are audiences around the world mesmerized by this stuff? Today I want to talk about why this is. And the answer, the preview that we're going to see is that the very thing that makes us love theater, the very thing that makes us engage with the folks we see on the stage is one of the same things that makes us human. It's one of the things that makes us and human audiences different from the guys that I study. And here's how I fit in here, despite my early foray into Broadway theater watching cheesy Peter Pan musicals, um, I'm actually not a Broadway artist. I'm a scientist who studies non-human primates, studies monkeys, and tries to figure out the way that they think about the world, the kinds of ways that make their mind different from ours. And what I'm gonna talk to you today about is two things that scientists are learning that allow us as humans to engage in theater. One of those things is something that's evolutionarily really old. It's exactly the kind of thing we can see in the guys that I study. But the second thing is something a little bit special. No other species that we know of out there has it. And it's the kind of thing I think that makes us special. But first I'll start with the kind of old cognitive quirk that I think is important for theater. It's one that we share with the monkeys and it's one that psychologists refer to in a jargony term as the phenomena of behavioral contagion. What does that mean? Well, lots of social organisms have phenomena that allow them to kind of get in behavioral sync with everybody else, right? Fish school, lemmings follow each other, and so on. We don't like to think that we as humans are like that as social beings, but it turns out that we are. We sometimes irresistibly take on the behaviors of other individuals. Just to see this in action, I'll tell you a bit about a study that was done by the psychologists Tanya Chartrand and John Barge. They brought subjects into the lab and they put them in mock interview situations. So the subject is just there on the right, he's interviewing, and unbeknownst to the subject, the experimenter is doing funny kinds of behaviors. She's either touching her face, wiggling her foot, and so on. And the question is, does the subject notice this and do they accidentally get into sync with it? And what you find is that subjects automatically copy the stuff that they see. They don't realize it, but they're irresistibly drawn to the behaviors of other people. This is the phenomena of behavioral contagion. It's important in its own right, but even more important is what it allows us to do psychologically, which is that we just don't get into sync with others' behaviors. We also get into sync with others' emotions. And we know this in part because behaviors aren't just there. They're often connected with the kinds of emotions we experience. So if I got mad up here right now, I might kind of adopt a stern posture like this, or if I got elated because you guys were laughing and clapping, I might make motions like this. But psychologists have learned that the causal arrow between behavior and emotion sometimes goes the other way too. It's not just that emotions cause us to behave in certain ways, sometimes just behaving in those ways can cause the emotion. And so another audience participation thing, I want you guys all to adopt the facial expression of this guy here on the right. I guess this is Colonel Pickering, right? Adopt that facial expression for me, right? You guys look really funny. But if I had, if I had the subtle measures that psychologists use to measure your emotion, all of you by adopting that expression would have gotten just a little bit happier. It's not just that behaviors, it's not just that emotions cause behaviors, Sometimes it's the behaviors that can cause those emotions. And this is a truly powerful thing that theater does. When, we're out, when you guys are out there in the audience watching on stage individuals behaving in certain ways, you don't just irresistibly copy those behaviors, you irresistibly copy those emotions as well. And it's a powerful technique that theater uses to get audiences in sync with the folks that are on stage. So when you're watching Camelot and everybody's behaving like this, you take on the emotions that go with it. And when you see later in Camelot all the folks on the stage are doing this, 
happiness, you take on the happiness as well. It's a particularly cool thing that we use as humans in lots of ways that other animals don't, but it's by no means just ours. This is a kind of quirk that ends up all over the animal kingdom. And I'll tell you two examples from our closest living relative, the chimpanzee. This is a species that folks have looked at a lot to try to see do they have emotional contagion as well. And what you find is that these guys are, are just as, find behaviors just as contagious as we do. Um, here's one example from the domain of contagious yawning, a behavior that's quite contagious. In fact, I won't leave this slide up for very long because some of you <laughs> who are empathic might start yawning and I would feel bad. But we can ask whether or not chimpanzees find this contagious too. And this is what the primatologist uh, Matthew Campbell and Franz de Waal did. They showed chimpanzees little iPhone videos of other chimpanzees yawning. And you can see how the chimps react. They see yawns, and they yawn too. Uh, but it's not just yawning. We can see chimpanzees catching other kinds of emotions and behaviors as well, such as contagious, contagious laugh. I'm glad this slide is working as well as it can, hearing you guys laugh. Um, but this is one that's well known in the theater. In fact, this goes back to, to the days of Greek theater when Greek producers realized that putting plants in the audience who laughed at the right times could make not only his audiences laugh, but his audiences find theater even more funny. Um, it's kind of like an early version of the cheesy laugh tracks we hear in sitcoms today. But chimpanzees could potentially have their own laugh track. They have a laugh behavior. It's kind of like... <laughs> as they breathe, and the psychologist Kim Bard and her colleagues analyzed videos of chimpanzees playing with each other, and what they found is contagious laughter in the species too. So if one chimpanzee laughed, an individual who was in their presence would be more likely to laugh as well. And so this is behavioral mechanism number one. We irresistibly get into sync with others' behaviors, and that means for free we can irresistibly get into sync with other individuals' emotions. It's an evolutionarily old process, but one that seems to be really important for live theater and live audience. Audiences. That's the old trait. Now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about the new trait, something that we alone as a species have. And that's the ability not just to jump inside other people's behaviors and emotions, but inside other people's minds. And this is the phenomena of mental contagion. And it's the case that when you're watching a live performance, watching individuals up there, you're not just engaging with their behavior and emotions, you know what's going on inside their heads. So you're thinking about what King Arthur's thinking, what his strategies are, what his secrets are, nothing from his behavior, but just stuff that's going on inside there. And what we're learning as psychologists is that these kinds of things can be contagious too. It's not just that we irresistibly jump into what he's thinking. We also seem to irresistibly take a little bit of that on ourselves, such that our own thoughts and processes might not be as pure as we think. We're affected by the thoughts around us. The neat thing that we're learning is that this is not an evolutionarily old process. This is something that we as humans alone do. And as a psychologist that studies what makes us special, this becomes particularly interesting to me. Because the newer processes, the ones that we alone as a species have, they're kind of just in beta testing. They tend to be a little bit glitchy. They don't work all that well. And we were interested in the question of whether or not these processes might work sometimes in some dumb ways, like the possibility that just as with behavioral and emotional contagion, maybe the contagion that we get from other people's minds is irresistible. Maybe it's automatic and we can't shut it off. This is what the psychologist Ian Apperley and his colleagues did. He tried to study whether or not people could shut off the kinds of things that other people were thinking. And I'm going to put you in the experiment that he ran. Here's your task. I'm going to show a bunch of dots on the screen. And all you have to do is to say the number of dots that are up there. There might be other stuff too, ignore that. But just say the number of dots. You ready? All right, here you go. All right, not another petition. Okay, so two things to notice. One, you guys are not great at this task. Um, <laughs> But, but there's a reason for that, as you'll see. You're not great at it, and you probably found some of them easier than others, right? There's a second thing to notice, though, which is why do I have this random like, person on the screen near the dots? That's actually the thing that Apperly and his colleagues were testing. He wanted to see if you got messed up by what this random drawing on the screen could see. And what he found was that you guys, as an audience, would be faster to say two when this other guy saw two than you would, in this case, to say the same thing two when this other guy saw something else. This is a phenomenon that he called ultra-centric interference, this idea that we're, we find interference from other people's ideas. And we're actually faster to negotiate things, to think about things in the world, to say stuff when other people have the same beliefs as us. 
This is just for a drawing on the screen, yet you irresistibly jump into his mind so much, it's messing up what you think to be true about the world. And we've now done the same kinds of studies with our monkey populations, basically giving them the same types of tasks. And what you find is that they can count small numbers of dots, they're fine with that. They can even tell us some information about what the other guy sees, but they don't irresistibly get messed up by what other guys see. They can think about other minds, but they can shut it off. It might only be us that has this irresistible contagion. All this is bad enough when we're talking about dots on a screen, but the theater does something even weirder. The theater causes us to think about beliefs that are just downright crazy, that boys can fly, that cats can sing, that spider people can spin webs on stages and so on. Like The theater wants us to engage with crazy, crazy stuff. Is it true that mental contagion is so powerful that we get stuck inside those kinds of beliefs too? This is the kind of thing that the psychologist Derek Lyons and his colleagues tried to study. And they did it in the context of trying to see if some people's crazy idea about problem solving could get stuck in your head. And here's the task he presented. He did this with adults and with little kids. He would present this puzzle box and he would say, try to see if you can find where there's a plastic turtle hidden in here. Right? Where could there be a plastic turtle? Well, most of it's transparent, so if you're thinking creatively, you might think, I bet it's inside that little tube, that's the only place it could be, and you would be correct. You shouldn't be proud of that, however, because four-year-old kids can also figure this out. It's really easy, right? The question is, would it still be really easy for you if you first saw somebody with a really dumb belief about how to solve the box? Somebody who did like crazy stuff to solve it, would that mess you up? And so here's Derek doing this uh, with human children, in this case. He's the guy on the right, and he's solving the box, not in the quick way of just opening it. He's doing all these dumb things, like sticking a rod into space in the middle of the box, doing all this extraneous stuff to solve it. This child knew how to solve the box before. What does he do after he's seen Derek do these crazy things? And what you find is that the child's own beliefs about how to solve the box are affected by this. Even a child who could have solved this perfectly before is so captivated by Derek's strategies, his beliefs, he can't get out of Derek's head and into his own. He can't solve it the same way. And lest you think this is just uh, human children, four-year-olds being weird, we can show the same thing with slightly more complicated boxes with you guys too. And I think this is the paradox of what we're dealing with as a species. What we find is that when you see somebody do all kinds of crazy things to a box, that affects your own beliefs. Other people's beliefs are so contagious that you will copy these crazy strategies even when you don't need to. And here's another spot where other animals, particularly other chimpanzees, are much smarter than us. These guys aren't good at tool use, but even though they're not good at tool use, they're not messed up by the other actions of others. When they see the same event of somebody doing this, they kind of ignore the stuff that's irrelevant, and they just go for what they know. And so this is, I guess, the good and the sad thing about the kinds of psychological mechanisms that make us uniquely able to jump into the minds of others, that make us uniquely able to process what's on the stage, where we seem to have a big divide between us and our closest living relatives. Other primates can jump into others' behaviors. They have lots of mechanisms for processing the emotions of others. And if we were to set up a play that just had to do with behaviors and emotions, I bet it would sell to lots of macaque monkeys and chimpanzees and so on. So <laughs> producers out there, you know, there's money to be made here. But, but only we as a species are capable of going beyond that. Only we are able to jump into the minds of other individuals, a powerful human capacity, but it leaves us really vulnerable. It leaves us with the possibility of getting stuck inside other minds, an evolutionarily new problem, and one that's pretty bad. Because the fact of the matter is, is a lot of you guys out there are producing situations where we're dealing with beliefs that are just downright crazy, that boys can fly, that cats can sing, and so on. When we engage with these things, we really seem to do so. These beliefs are so contagious that even for a moment, we take them on as our own. On the one hand, this can lead us to conforming to some really, really dumb stuff. It can lead us to mess up our problem solving. It can lead us to take on beliefs that are not our own. But the flip side is that it also leaves us with a uniquely human benefit. And that's the fact that we can engage in theater. You guys can sit out there and have a wondrous, awesome, terrific, mesmerizing experience just watching the simple behaviors and thoughts that you see on the stage. And yes, while this leaves us in some cases a little bit dumber than chimpanzees, I think probably as a human, I gotta say it's worth it. And so with that, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you.